question. Have you guys all been here before? Okay, you're welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for spending this Thursday night with us. My name is Kate, and I work here at the People's Forum. If you haven't been here before, we are a political and uh, cultural center, community center. We screen movies every Thursday. We also have classes going on all the time. We actually have a course on the Caribbean histories of Caribbean of the oh, sorry histories of revolutions in the Caribbean region going on. That's been ongoing. We've got an upcoming class on Lenin. We also have an ongoing class on science against capitalism, exiting the climate crisis. So we have a lot of ways to engage, to get involved, to begin your journey in the movement and fighting for working class liberation all over the world. <laughs> um, as a political education center, it is very exciting for us to be having tonight's book talk, Class, Race, and Gender, Challenging the Injuries and Divisions of Capitalism. From what I've heard, this book is an excellent resource on talking about everything from environmental injustice, militarism, racism, white supremacy, patriarchy, male chauvinism, periodic economic crises, the list goes on and on, which is why we're excited to be joined by very experienced organizers here who have a long list of accolades that I will begin to read to you now. <laughs> Um, we're jo joined by Jamel Coy Hudson, who is a lecturer, professor in rhetorician. Rhetorician, my bad. Um, he is a lecturer of rhetoric and public advocacy in the Department of Communication Studies at CUNY Baruch College, and also taught as a faculty member in the Department of Writing Studies and Rhetoric at his alma mater, Hofstra University. Currently, he serves as the tri chair of the New York State Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and is, is committed to realizing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision of beloved community. Yeah, give it up. <laughs> We're also joined by Juliet Uselli, a founder of the Brecht Forum slash New York Marxist School and Italian Americans for multi Multicultural US, and a longtime organizer in public school anti-racist and anti-war movements. She has served in the National Leadership of Liberation Road and writes and teaches on Marx's capital, human development and psychology. Um, I'll also introduce Darnell Velasquez, who is a community organizer with New York Communities for Change. He's organized multiple campaigns on climate justice, public safety, and education with a focus on housing slash tenant rights. His most recent success was mobilizing tenants to win a 0% rent increase in the village of Hempstead. Can you do that in, the in yeah. Flatbush for me? <laughs> 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 Um, having completed the studio recording technology program at Nassau Community College, he emphasizes incorporating art and music into the movement space. And of course, we're jo joined by tonight's author, Michael Zweig, who is the founding director of the Center of Study for Working Class Life and Emeritus Professor of Economics at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, where he received the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. He's also a member of the New York State Coordinating Committee of the Poor People's Campaign. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's an elected member of the executive board of the uh, United University Professions at Stony Brook. Prior to this book, he, his books include The Working Class Majority and Religion and Economic Justice. And he lives with his wife in New York City and on the North Fork of Long Island, where for over 30 years, he has served as a volunteer in the South Hold Fire Department. Um, without further ado, I'll put you guys in very good hands. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, also to the uh, People's Forum here. It's a terrific institution. Is this better? All right, I, I just had, oh, that's even better. 
I just need to uh, eat the microphone here, it's like, <laughs> like it's ice cream cone or something. So um, I just want to thank the uh, uh, People's Forum here. It's a terrific institution, and it's just a great pleasure and an honor for us all to be here tonight to talk about, uh, to talk about this book and to have this terrific panel with me. Uh, and I was thinking about how to do all this uh, with this uh, book. Often book tours involve just readings where people uh, just take a part of their book and just read it. This isn't a book that lends itself to that. It's a book that has a lot of moving parts. And it's also, as far as I'm concerned, the way to introduce this book to you is to introduce it through a conversation with uh, the people who are at the table who can start that conversation and then that will extend out to everybody in the room who wants to participate. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, this evening. I'm going to be speaking for something like uh, 20 minutes or so and uh, then they'll all chime in for five or six minutes. We'll have a little bit of a back and forth and then it'll come out to you guys. That's the plan. And I understand we're being live streamed on uh, the YouTube channel that the People's Forum has. So that's good for whoever could find out about it. But it also means that the program will live on that YouTube channel. So if uh, you have friends who want to get a sense of what we're doing here, they can uh, tune in on that uh, YouTube channel anytime. So let me get uh, now into this book, Class, Race, and Gender. Uh, challenging the injuries and divisions of capitalism. It does have a forward by the Reverend William Barber of the uh, Poor People's Campaign. What this book is for, it's for you guys who are organizers and who are trying to change the world and figure out how, that, how to do that and how the world works. Because it's not enough to be mad, it's not enough to be pissed off, although that's plenty of uh, what is going on in this room, I'm sure, and in the larger world. But just to be mad and just to scramble around, uh, go from demonstration to demonstration and rally to rally as an activist, uh, isn't gonna cut it. What we need to do is go beyond being activists to be organizers and to build social movements that have a lasting capacity. And to do that requires knowing something about what's going on that drives the conditions that we live in. And that is what I'm trying to do here. Uh, I'll just say, as a way of uh, defining uh, terms, if we talk about progressive politics, all that I mean is any program, any politics that alleviates suffering and any politics that uh, enhances or increases the cultural, intellectual, or organizational capacity of the working class. To me, that's progress. Anything that gets in the way of that, that's regression. So uh, when I talk about progressive politics, that's what I'm trying to uh, promote with this book and with the activists who are in that same, <clears throat> moving in that same, uh, same direction. Uh, I'll, when I was coming up 60 years ago working in the social movements, uh, we were not only activists, but we read. We read all the time. We had study groups. We had all kinds of places where we looked into what was going on because we didn't find it in our classes. I mean, the classes were just useless. Uh, <laughs> and so some of us decided, well, we just have to figure this stuff out on our own. And we did that sort of walking on two legs between activism and theory and practice and practice and theory basically for our whole lives. And that's what I've been doing. We have Bill Tabb here, who was one of those original Union for Radical Political Economics people, also has been doing that. So many other people here who in their own ways have been involved in that process of relating theory and practice and practice and theory to try to figure out what to do and how to understand. So when, when I was coming up, and some of you were coming up who were older, uh, we didn't really care about who was speaking. We just cared about what they were saying. These days, that's not good enough. These days, you have to say something about who you are. And so I'll take a minute or two to say something about how I got here. And there's some material about that in the introduction to this book. Uh, I come out of an immigrant family. I'm the first person in America, born in America in my family. Uh, English is not my first language. Uh, and, and I learned in 1945 and 1946 on the streets in Detroit, 
it's not good to speak German. So, so I figured out, okay, I guess I better learn this new language, which I did. Uh, and the thing that got me going, and the thing that really informs a lot of what's in this book, was Emmett Till. Emmett Till was murdered in 1955. He was 14, I was 13. And uh, because of the bravery of his mother, I got to see those pictures of him in that open casket. Now, some Holocaust families tell their children about it, and some don't. I was in a family where my mother told me about it. So I knew about the people in my family who'd been murdered and tortured and burned alive and uh, sent up the chimney, as my father used to say. And so when I saw Emmett Till, you know, it was, a, hey, wait a second. We came to America to get away from that. But here it is. We can't have that. And that was the beginning of me trying to deal with what's going on and try to understand it and put an end to it. And what I came to understand is sort of encapsulated in this, in this, uh, in this book. Now, one of the things that, uh, as a social movement and as activists, I think it's important for us to understand is what's the period that we're in? What's the nature of the condition, the general social conditions that we're operating under? And in that regard, I will say that we are living in a period of capitalism triumphant. The working class over the last 150 years has devised many ways to resist the power of capital. Working class people have organized nonviolently, violently, in reform, in revolution, through unions, through other forms of organization. And I think it's safe to say that we got beat. <laughs> and we're living in an era now where we really have to, in a way, start from scratch. And it's, it's a daunting task. It really is a daunting task. Now, in this country, part of the way that we lost, I'll just take you back very quickly to 19, late 60s and into the 1970s, it was a completely different environment. That was an environment in which capital was on the run. That was an environment in which the ruling class didn't know what the hell to do with us because we were in the street and we were in the street about war, we were in the street about race, we were in the street about gender, we were in the street about homosexuality, we were in the street about who runs the schools, is it the students who, or the university that's there is our parents, you know, that old in loco parentis thing. Well, you know, no matter which part of that movement you were in at that time, we all understood that we were part of an overall movement that wasn't just our issue. It wasn't just that we were against the war. We were against racism, too. We were against all kinds of things that the ruling class was putting down on all segments of society. And the ruling class knew that. And not only did they capitulate to us in the Civil Rights Act and in the Voting Rights Act, and then we had the Clean Water Act, Nixon signed it, the Clean Air Act, Nixon signed it, the OSHA legislation, Occupation Safety and Health, Nixon signed it. Yo, hey, wait a minute. So there was a guy named Lewis Powell. Lewis Powell was a white shoe lawyer in Richmond, Virginia, with a big list of corporate clients, including the US Chamber of Commerce. And he wrote a memorandum, the so-called Powell Memorandum, that uh, I start this book out with, because it's important for us to understand that what we are living through now is not ju didn't just happen, didn't just fall out of the sky. What Lewis Powell did in 1970 and 71, and when he crafted that memorandum, he said to the Chamber of Commerce, we have to defend not only our own industry, not only our own particular company, we have to defend the system itself, the market system, the capitalist system. And to do that, we have to pool our resources across all industries so that we are not just championing the oil and gas industry through the Oil and Gas Association or the auto industry or the Michigan Milk Producers Association that wants you to drink milk and eat cheese. We have to get all of that together to defend the system and push back all elements of these movements that are threatening us and challenging us across the board. And that has to be done deliberately and consciously. And you know what? They did it deliberately and consciously. 
in the 1970s is where you get the Heritage Foundation. It's where you get the Cato Institute. It's where you get the Federalist Society. It's where you get the American Lib uh, Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC. You get all of this ap uh, apparatus that gets built up specifically and explicitly to push us back in the churches, in the religious uh, stabs, everywhere. And you know what? They won. They did it. And we were responding in our individual movements, always just in our movements. And what I'm trying to do in this book, and actually what the Poor People's Campaign is trying to do, is to build a few, what we call in the Poor People's Campaign a fusion movement that draws all of that together into one movement that has a moral and ethical foundation, which also challenges capitalism in that arena. And what this book is trying to do is to be a resource, an educational resource, for people who want to know more about that, for people who want to think about that a little bit more deeply. Now, there are a lot of different elements uh, to this uh, story. And I'm just going to pick out two questions. One, why is production and the economy the center of all that we have to talk about? That's number one. And number two, related to that, what are classes? And, and how, do, how does class dynamics work? So I'm just going to say very briefly about those two, about those two uh, elements. The centrality of production arises because if you don't produce, you die. I mean, I just, 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 let's just get down to it. If somebody doesn't produce, if somebody doesn't produce, if the society isn't organized in such a way that there is enough to keep the producing population going, the society collapses. It doesn't matter what your religious beliefs are or how you pray or what kind of politics you have. If you aren't producing as a society, the society is going to collapse. So now that brings us to the centrality of production. Now production is a process. It's not just a technical thing, it's also a social engagement. And part of what happens is as people have learned to produce and to produce more and more and to be ever more productive, they produce more than they need for just getting by. Now, if you're out among the Kwakutl in the northwest, uh, in the coast uh, in British Columbia, the First Nations people up there, if you have a surplus, you have a party. <laughs> you know, if you got more than you need, hey, let's just back off from doing anything for a couple of weeks and eat that up and have a, have a ball. Well, that is one thing you can do with the surplus, but what happened, it turns out, in human history, in most societies, is that somebody came along and said, you know that surplus that you got produced over there? It's mine. I'm taking it. And people say, what, you're taking it? Well, we made that. And, they, and then they, 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 nah, you know, they came up with all kinds of reasons for why it's okay for them to take it. All kinds of reasons why they did it and they're in charge and they belong in the top of the society and they can take it. And those people who make that assertion, the first thing they need is a military. They need a police, they need an army because their people are gonna resist that. So the whole history of human development is a history of different ways of producing and then different ways of harnessing that surplus and deciding what is that surplus going to do. Is it going to be a castle? Is it going to be a painting? Is it going to be a nice uh, uh, a meal? Or is it going to be something that can be used to produce more things? A capitalism is a society in which the surplus is a form that can be used to produce more things. That's why it's a society and an economy that grows as much as it does, as opposed to feudal societies and slave societies. Now, production means, and the production of a surplus means that there are these two groups of people in the society, those who are producing and those who are taking what's being produced. And that's organized in different ways in different countries, different societies, and I have some details about that in here I'm not going to go through here unless there are questions. I'll just say that what happens is that there develops class divisions. Essentially the class of people who produce 
and the class of people who take that surplus and help to define, and you can get into old struggle about what is surplus and who gets it and how is it allocated, and all those things are issues that I'll deal with in this book, but I don't want to f uh, focus on that here. I want to come back to Emmett Till and race. Now, uh, Sean Ahern was here earlier, and I wrote him a little inscription in the book thanking him for his work in keeping the legacy of Ted Allen. On. Yeah, uh, I, I, uh, Sean Ahern was here earlier, and I wrote him a little inscription thanking him for keeping the legacy of Ted Allen alive and the work that Ted Allen did in demonstrating that the importance of American history, we didn't just have slavery. Yes, we had slavery, everybody knows that. We had racial slavery. Now having racial slavery is not just slavery. That was imposed by the British at the end of the 17th century in order to divide a united African and English working population that was rebelling in Virginia against English rule. And the British said, well, you know that old divide and conquer trick, that's what they did. And the way that they did it was they implemented a racial division within the working population that we're living with today. Now I'm here, you know, we, that's a whole long story. I'll only say that what we should get from that is that you cannot understand the problem of race in this country if you don't understand the problem of class. And you can't understand class unless you understand how race in, in, intersections with it. So race and class and race and gender, gender and class are all mutually determined. They're separate, but they're also mutually determined. And as we approach the problem of uh, race in this country, we have to understand that. Now I'm gonna put one more piece into the mix here. I have a little piece in here. As I was writing, I, I came to understand or feel like I had to write a section of a chapter that's called A Note to White Readers. And I just wanna say something about what's in that note to white readers. <clears throat> and, and here's basically the story that I wanna uh, put to you. We have a society of white supremacy and black people can organize against it, and Hispanics can organize against it, and all kinds of people can organize against it, but until white people put it down, it's not going anywhere. It is up to white people to put that down. Now, how does that happen? Well, there's a whole discussion about how you d deal with those issues of racism in the course of struggle, in the course of really confronting power, and looking for who are your friends and who are your enemies, and digging deep into what the dynamics are, and that's a whole discussion. But I wanna say that as I was looking at this stuff, I remembered Franz Fanon, one of the people that we read back in the day, a book called um, The Wretched of the Earth. And I mentioned earlier that we didn't read that in school, we read that on our own, trying to figure out what the hell's going on. And what Franz Fanon, who was a psychiatrist from Martinique, who was living in Algeria, noticed was that the oppressed know everything about the oppressor, and the oppressor knows nothing about the oppressed. And when I read that, I just thought, wait a second. So if we wanna understand what it means to be white, and if we wanna understand white people, don't talk to other white people, talk to black people. Because that's who knows what's going on. So who would that be? Well, that would be Malcolm. That would be uh, James Baldwin. That would be a whole bunch of other people. So I read James Baldwin for this book. I put in some Baldwin. But then I, as I was going through that and thinking about it, it struck me one day, you remember that Martin Luther King speech that we all hear about? Oh, uh, we have to be judged not by the color of our skin, but the content of our character. Remember that? And that's true. Until I was writing this book, I thought that what he was saying was that we black people have to be judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That's a legitimate claim. 
But what I came to understand is that goes for us too. There is not one thing about being white as a social category in this country that is worth holding on to and, and saying, yep, that's me. Not one thing. All we have as we go into these discussions is the content of our character. Not one other thing. And if we go into discussions about racial justice or having those conversations, you know, those difficult conversations, well, I've been in a lot of those conversations over the years, and I've learned a thing or two. And one of the things I learned that really struck me, almost like an epiphany, was all I've got is the content of my character. That is it. And that's what I try to put in this book, and I'll leave it at that. When we have comments, I don't know how we want to organize this, but you'll all have some things to say, and then we'll have a discussion, and then it's all up, up here. Thank you. Bismillah, I seek refuge in Allah from Shaitan the accursed, and in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you, and God's mercy and blessings, and members of this beloved community. Thank you for being here at the People's Forum for this great conversation on class, race, and gender, challenging the injuries and divisions of capitalism. Please join me in giving our brother Michael Swagger a round of applause for producing a great, a great work. I've read the work, it's an excellent text. It gives great, great insight and helps organizers who are starting out on their journey, seasoned organizers, really understand the landscape. Uh, and I wanna thank you for this um, opportunity to have intergenerational dialogue, right? From persons who have been organizing since the 60s, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and can give clear analysis of where we are today. A um, Few months ago, brother Michael and I sat down for brunch, it was around noon, and uh, we started talking to Bois and Fanon, and we started to get into the conversation. He said, will you come to the book talk? I said, absolutely, sir. I said, absolutely. It's a great book, and I have just a few remarks to give that uh, hopefully are timely and appropriate. Um, revolutions can only happen when the measures are right, and you've given us great insight to help understand when those chirotic moments happen, and um, there's no doubt that all of us have been impacted by capitalism and has left us all scarred and hurt. And your title gives reference to the intersection of class, race, and gender. But there's a section of your text that I wanted to highlight specifically, and it's something we talked about during our brunch, and that's the role of religion. During our conversation, you candidly shared with me that you, sir, are an atheist, and I shared how I have embraced Islam and followed the Quran and Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, present peace be upon him. And we had our conversation, our struggle, and we both recognized that religion plays a significant role in the structural society we live in, in the edifices that perpetuate class, race, and gender oppression, period. We acknowledge that, we make it clear that the church, religious Outlets have perpetuated violence against the poor, all in the name of religion. Your text speaks about the excommunication of Galileo and the church and numerous instances where white church leaders have interpreted the Bible to legitimize white supremacy and justify the maltreatment of black bodies. There's no doubt that religion has been a culprit, again, to continue to perpetuate this violence. Then in one of the texts, one of the sections of your text you speak on and most of us have probably heard of this Karl Marx quote, that religion is the opium of the masses, but what I appreciate about your text is it gives clarity to the nuances in the context behind what Marx was saying. Right? He acknowledged that religion can provide comfort for the relief uh, for the oppressed and can be a sigh of the oppressed in a place of solace in a harsh world. So I wanna make two points in my raising of the role of religion um, in this conversation. First, I identify that you don't need to be of a particular religious community to do good. That there's space, and that's not always easy because we're in often spaces where it's binary, where you're in a religious mindset and you're void of seeing social justice efforts or you're in a social justice space and you're hostile to religious outlets. And maybe rightfully so, the church has scorned and hurt a lot of people. Religious institutions have hurt and hurt a lot of people. So th there's legitimate grievance behind that. Uh, so I want to make the invitation to say all human beings of good conscience, of goodwill, take any political, uh, philosophical mindset and can organize and can, and can make good uh, and bring forth what Dr. King called the beloved community. That's without a doubt. Now, 
to speak from my perspective of a, as, as a person of faith, I think that this text gives great um, uh, support for the role for, for persons who want to merge their spirituality and a focus on justice organizing. And it's best embodied in the text that discusses liberation theologies. In particular, the writings of Dr. James Cone. I remember when I first came across Dr. James Cone and how his, um, his words changed my affections. It made me move from just seeing my, per my faith as some passive experience where there's just a divine source that moves me individually, but made me see my service to God is connected to my service to the fellow human beings in my life and to establish a more just society for all human beings. And Dr. Cohn gives persons of faith a hermeneutics or readings of scripture where you can read from the bottom from the voice of the marginalized. He would say, uh, the God of the slave master is not the God of the slave. That's calling on God to free them is not the God that the slave master is calling to keep you in, in, enslaved and in shackles. And I wanna encourage all of those who read this text and all of those who are um, in faith traditions, I'll read a particular text from chapter seven, religions, values, and interests, it says, Particularly, many Islamic beliefs and practices are not fixed and permanent across time. The same is true of Christian and Jewish beliefs and practices. We should understand that all religions have been deeply transformed in the context of broader social conflicts. That our, relig our, our faith expressions don't happen in a vacuum. They are a part of our lens, our biases, the edifices that perpetuate and continue these practices. So I want to encourage you all to struggle. There's a battle for the Bible. There's a battle for the Quran. There's a battle for the Torah. There's a battle to decide who gets to interpret and understand me, myself, as a Muslim, my wife, my family. We've committed ourselves to submitting to the will of Allah and establishing a just society as black American Islamic liberation freedom fighters. We've centered the justice for poor at the heart of our work and recognize that fusion efforts are the way things get done. That I cannot do this in silo. I need my brothers and sisters from all different faith traditions. And I sincerely believe, as I come to my close, that the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, has the clarity and the analysis to know how to take faith and reason. And like the wings of a bird move us forward and propel us into a better, clearer understanding of what Dr. King called that beloved community. So as I close, I invite all people of good conscience to read the book, uh, to recognize that there's good and potential in all of us to engage in this struggle. And whatever faith tradition you're coming from, or if you're just a good person that wants to do right, I encourage you to struggle and engage in what will certainly make this world a better place. Assalamu alaikum. Let me just say that I think we'll just have comments in, uh, from Juliet and then also from Darnell. I'll say something in response and then we'll open it up. Okay. I can. can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I think we all need to take some rhetoric classes from Jamel. Okay, sign me up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so. I really appreciate this book as I've appreciated Michael's previous books because there is no book that gives such clear definitions of what's the working class, who's in it and who's not, what's the middle class, what's the ruling class, and how is the ruling class different from just the capitalist class. I'm not going to give all these definitions because that's why you're going to read the book, but they are the best and I always use them in teaching. I use Michael's data and it just is an indispensable aid there. And one question I'll ask you, Michael, is because I know you said with, because I worked in the public school system for 27 years. I was a social worker in the New York City public high schools and done some teaching as well. And when you, you talked about 60% uh, of teachers being probably in more working class positions based on having their work more controlled um, versus 40% being in more professional positions. And I am curious if you know where there's been recent uh, organizing among teachers in really new states that didn't have teacher unions, if they tend to be from more the 60% that are working class or the 40% that are middle class, if you can answer that, that, that would be great. I'll leave that for later. Um, I don't know. 
Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, you answer that. Okay. Take care of that. Okay. Um, now, um, I, um, I also, I, there's this one great thing that Baldwin said about white people that I just want to pull out, and he said, um, oh, shit, where is it? Um, my notes are a mess, but James Baldwin said um, that when, um, once the hate is gone, he said this of white people, they're forced to deal with their own pain, which I think is very interesting and insightful. Um, now, where I, I there's two two things I'll um, just uh, pick a little difference with Michael, and one is I think that in the book and in some of the sources you cite, there's a kind of idealization of working class culture, um, and I I myself don't see that there's this one genuine working class culture. I think it differs a lot based on race and ethnicity and national origin and how long your family's been in the country. If you're not First Nations, what kind of work you do and what what kind of bonds there are in that work. Um, I grew up in a particular working class culture in white Catholic Staten Island in the 50s and 60s. It was a culture from which I mostly wanted to escape. Um, now, um, it was, um, it was, and, and this, this relates to an issue that you also raised, and I want to try to bring these two issues together. Um, one of the things you say is that when people haven't had the opportunity to learn abstract and critical thinking skills, they are very prone to be swallowing all the hateful shit that comes out of uh, this society in terms of stereotypes about other people, in terms of who's to blame for social ills, in terms of all kinds of irrational theories. Um, now, I see, um, so, and one of the things, you know, that's been noted by people who are organizing uh, in um, swing states, for example, my friend John Liss, who's uh, started uh, New Virginia Majority, um, you know, which got the state to go for Obama and was very key in that election. John said that what you find in terms of white people is that the core of people who tend to stick with the Democrats and not fall for Trump tend to be people with moderate income and high education. Um, and he named people like teachers and nurses and other kinds of civil servants and people who are in helping professions, not not the, the top end of the professions, like not the doctors, but others. And that, that really has me thinking that for, um, when there's a rich social movement, I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities to learn critical thinking and to take apart false consciousness, right? You have study groups and, you know, there's been study groups in factories and fields and in every revolution. But when that's not there, how do ordinary, when ordinary working people don't have the time, don't have the opportunity to learn that, it's like, you know, keep up with the Kardashians and, you know, um, a lot of worry about debt. God knows people have reason to worry about debt and their real physical survival. But it's really hard to get a more um, human and true view of the world. And, th and that's a thing I wrestle with a lot. Um, the final thing, I'm pointing out, Michael, this must be some kind of mistake. I read this sentence, um, and I think somebody misedited you. Okay, I'm going to say what it is. Are you sorry you invited me? Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. It says, um, page 117, after World War II, the U.S. is the dominant capitalist power. The result was a series of proxy civil wars between the US and China or the Soviet Union, most notably destructive in Korea, Vietnam, Central America, and Angola. Now, at first, I couldn't figure what the hell you were saying. Then I realized you were probably referring to the fact that when Vietnam had a national liberation movement and wanted independence, and the US and France didn't want them to have independence, they moved toward, the Soviet, uh, toward getting aid from the Soviet Union, and then, the U.S. established a fake government to have a proxy civil war. But I wouldn't get all that if I didn't know it from reading the sentence. Um, I'm presuming you agree with me, right? But I'm, I'm just noting that because, you know, shit like that happens sometimes in editing. Um, but, but overall, um, I find it to be um, an incredible resource, and I very much appreciate that you did it.
Hello, can y'all hear me? Uh, first off, I wanna give a huge thank you to Michael for inviting me to this event. This is my first time ever at the People's Forum, first time ever at any book talk of any sort, so bear with me. Um, just to give quick context, my name is Darren Velasquez. Uh, just like Michael, I am first generation as well. Um, how do I put this? I related a lot to this material because of the fact that I feel like there was parallels in what I've been through and what you've been through, even though you did it many years ago. And that to me was very, very, very intriguing. Uh, when he mentioned in some point where you were a very critical atheist of religion, I was like that for a lot of my life where, I, I well, I grew up in a Catholic house and then I eventually, you know, became an atheist, and and in my in my brain, I started to equivalent faith with conservatism and and religion with the people who are keeping all these bad ideas and conserving all these bad stuff. Because again, that was my upbringing. You know, I came in a Catholic in a Catholic church and with uh, a whole bunch of uh, land immigrants and and all these conservative cultural ideas that I know in my life came from within the church walls. So I, I guess, perceive that as this is where that comes from. But it was only until really recently that that shifted. And that was with meeting Michael and Jamel and the rest of the Poor People's Campaign, uh, seeing how much they have been contributing to the movement. And I'm like, these are a bunch of deacons and preachers. and. Uh, it's, uh, all, you know, like I was like, it, it opened my eyes. It really did. So I'm, I'm forever grateful for them for, for uh, letting me experience that in, in the beginning, like j just first and foremost. Um, but yeah, I also want to touch on what she mentioned regarding um, what, what did you say? You got, uh, no, no, no. There was something you mentioned that I wanted to touch on. I can't remember what it was. Yes, yes. So the working class culture, right? So one thing that is amazing to me is when you talk about the disconnection, right, between the people. Because me and people my age, we grew up with social media, all this content everywhere. It's so accessible. From middle school and on, I always had this information in front of me. And yet, it took a long time for me to really get the stuff I needed. And it just makes you wonder, you know, um, whether that was manufactured, whether that was a thing of chance, or whether it's because I was born in a certain community that I didn't get the privilege of having those, uh, 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 that information in front of me. So I think having a book like this uh, allows somebody to sharpen those those cloudy thoughts they have in their life, you know? Because, you know, everybody has those moments in their life where, you know, they have a certain altercation in a grocery store and they're like, why did they treat me that way? Or maybe your boss speaks to you a certain way and you start questioning uh, the validity of their power over you. And, or, or you realize, like, I know I had a moment where I was working at Apple and I saw an announcement of how much money Tim Cook made in a year. And I'm like... Hold up, like, I'm like barely making 20 bucks an hour. Like, how does that make, it just, it, it, like, you start to put two and two, but you don't really have like that, 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 that focal point of what the problem is. So I feel like going through this and, and like she said, the definitions of certain words that are, can be left to nuance a little too much sometimes. You know, sometimes it's good that certain phrases, like he said, progressivism, what is it? It's anything that we can do to push our people forward, to uplift however many individuals out of poverty, but more importantly, change the societal structure that caused poverty to begin with, you know? So I, I, I'm definitely very inspired and, and I do wanna, carry the torch, like they say, right? And I hope to make some friends in here who want to do the same thing. Cause you know, um, one side point, one again about the whole connection stuff, right? One thing that I realized too, is through the same 
social media world, we have felt connected to the owner class in a weird way because we see them every day. We see them cooking with their families. We see videos with them and their pets. Like when I have conversations with friends, they're telling me about the everyday life of the people they, they, they're fans of. And that humanizes them. But like you say, we know everything about them, but they have no clue what your birthday is. They don't know what your favorite dish is. They don't know whether your family, whether your kid had a food yesterday, whether you could pay your rent. Like there's such a huge uh, one-way relationship right now with us and the people that, uh, that control our lives. And, and it's so, so frustrating because we have to have so much more pride than that. You know, we have to, like, I want us to start looking at the people next to us as our idols, you know? Like, I want to tell people, like, I'm with Michael Swag right now. Like, you know, like, I'm right here, you know? Like, come on now. Like, you know? So I want to keep it that, you know, as sure as I can. I, I know I can ramble on, but, again, um, nothing but positivity I got from this. Nothing but... Um, shaping my brain and, and really shifting my, my ideas into something more foundational so that when I can speak to folks, it isn't a wishy-washy, where do we stand? No, there's clarity. We know what we're fighting for. We know who we're fighting for, and we know what side we're on. So thank you very much. Yeah, that's why I invited him. As, you know, I mean, not not that he's on my side, but he's a smart fella and he's articulate and he's young and he's coming up to take the torch. And uh, let's let's hear it for that. You know, it's, talking about taking the torch, I'll just say this: I I I was at the August 1963 March for Jobs and Freedom in. Uh, Washington, where King gave that very famous speech, which I heard, and it was a good speech. But uh, what what really stuck with me, and I think I told you this, Darno. I mean, uh, uh, Jamel, what really stuck with me that day was an announcement that came from the stage that on that day, W. E. B. Du Bois had passed in Accra. And I thought, holy moly, W.B. Du Bois passed today, and we are here today. This is our time to take up W.B. Du Bois's task. This is our time to take that up. And this is your all time to take that up, too. That is, you know, what I'll take out of that. Um, on this question of religion, I said before that, uh, that production is the center of everything. And I tried to explain a little bit about why that would be. But one consequence of that is that every other aspect of society, politics and religion and the law and culture, all of it, in one way or another has to endorse and support and encourage that structure of production, or at least not get in its way. And any aspect of religion, politics, culture, any aspect of what else is going on that interferes with production, the people who run the show want to destroy it, want to push it to the side. Now, when we come to the question of religion in that regard, I just come back to Bob Dylan, who got a Nobel Prize for a good reason. And one of his lyrics is, you got to serve somebody. Remember that? Now, that's in a, one of the gospel albums. But the whole point of you got to serve somebody is it doesn't matter who you are, your activity is part of some larger process. And you have to ask yourself, who is it that you're serving in that activity and in that process? That's the question. Now, I was in the Maoist movement in the 1970s. I was in a revolutionary communist party, and that didn't work out all that well. And I came, came out of that a little disoriented. And here was 1981, 1982, and I was thinking, well, there's no way to do politics now, right? You're sunk, because all that revolutionary stuff was a dead end. What are you gonna do? 
And I looked around and I thought, and I saw that there were a whole lot of people who were actually doing things. They were doing things about Central America. They had uh, sanctuary churches that they were organizing in sanctuary cities. They were doing stuff about apartheid. They were doing all kinds of things. And who were they? A lot of them were religious. And I had, in, I think 1985, I think it was, maybe even a little earlier than that, I taught a class on Marx in, at Stony Brook, and this guy comes in at the beginning of the semester and wants to take the class. And he introduces himself as the Catholic chaplain at Stony Brook. And I think, oh my goodness gracious, now I'm going to have somebody on the front row of every class telling me how I am the Antichrist. <laughs> but it wasn't true. What he told me was that there is such a thing as liberation theology. I'd never heard of it. Now, Bill Tabb sitting here had heard of it, and he was involved in that already before me and helped me understand it. Thank you very much. But the question of liberation theology, to your point, is that salvation is not a matter of individual belief and individual practice. Salvation is the process of taking apart structures of sin, structures that create sinful conditions. Now, that's an understanding of religion that people who practice their religion in behalf of capital don't like. So now you have a situation in which religious practice, whether it's among Jews or, or Catholics or Protestants or Buddhists or Muslims or whoever they are, you got to serve somebody. And in a society which is class conflicted and in a society where there are these deep divisions that result in suffering and oppression, every institution in the society is implicated in that one way or another. And that means that the struggle that we all in this room are engaged in, doesn't matter if you're in a school, doesn't matter if you're in a factory or in a call center or in a religious establishment, doesn't matter where you are, we're all in that same struggle together. And that is a struggle that challenges all those institutions and the moral compass that ought to and that does guide those institutions. So I'll just just say a, a last thing about uh, the idealization of working class culture to, uh, to Julia. Yes, culture is complicated and class cultures are complicated, but I got persuaded by um, Barbara Jensen. I got persuaded by uh, Jack Metzger. I got persuaded by uh, people who are deep into the question, and here's the distinction that they're trying to make, that I, the way I understand it. There's a culture of belonging, and there's a culture of becoming. The working class culture is typically a culture of belonging, where people just want to be part of their family and their communities and have a barbecue and have a good life, and that's what they want. Nothing wrong with them. Middle class culture or corporate culture is a culture of becoming. How many of us in this room are intellectuals or academics and all we want to do is get tenure? All we want to do is publish another book. All we want to do is to become, right? To grow and not be satisfied with who we are. And what that leads to is this understanding of the American dream, right? Which is Oh, work hard and do all that stuff, and then you can be somebody. Well, wait a second. What's the matter with just being somebody? How come you got to go through all this rigmarole to be somebody? Why don't you just be somebody, just be a human being and go to work and drive a bus or do electrical work or whatever it is? The way in which we talk about and impose that culture of achievement, of belong, of, of, uh, uh, culture of, of becoming itself becomes an oppressive condition to ordinary working people who keep getting told that, oh, by the way, you never made it, so you're nothing. You didn't make the American dream. You're not a real American. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I just want to throw that into the mix. That's what we're trying to get at with this question of culture. We'll give it to Darnell and then we'll open it up. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that. 
uh, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine a few nights ago. And because I was telling him about certain actions that I've been attending. And this is somebody who's completely apolitical in their own world, right? And we started having those conversations about uh, how things are regarding where you got to win this, uh, the game of life. And you got to be the that one percenter, that one of a million person who makes it the top and, and beats everybody to get there, right? So I asked him a theoretical question. I was like, because he was trying to understand ideas of like communism and all this type of stuff. Because his, his idea of communism was like, everybody's equally suffering. And I'm like, it's not really that, but yeah. But so I gave him a theoretical. I was like, look, man, this, there's two worlds we can look at. One of them is the current idea of, it's pretty much like a lottery where there's 100,000 people and only one person can make it, but that one person is going to be very, very successful and very wealthy and it lives pretty much heaven on earth, right? Everything to their toes, to their to the shoulders. I was like, would you rather have that life where you might get that? Or would you rather be in a world where everybody is, like you said, just living comfortably, not looking for food, not looking if they got rent money, where their health is okay and then things are all right? And he preferred to take the chance. And it just, I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. And for, and I asked him like, why? And, and, and he's just like, it's, it's like a weird, it's like the thrill of it. It's like, wouldn't you want to be known as the person who did that? You know? And it's like, that's, there's like such a huge hyper individualistic view of that, that it's just, I can't wrap my mind, my, my head around it. Cause obviously I've shaken out of that. I will say at one point, one point in my life, I was there as well. You know, because I grew up recording music and, you know, being a songwriter. And, you know, like you show, you show people music and they always do the whole like, oh, don't forget about me in 10 years when, you, when you're when up there. And I'm like, I, I get the compliments, but I don't like that idea of where, you know, you're going to just leave everybody behind and, and drift into the heavens and forget about the whole community that allowed you to even get there. You know, and it's just, I hope with more conversations, people who think like that can start to understand that it's just a, it's an unsustainable model for anybody, you know, so. Okay, one last thing I'll, I'll stick in here and then we'll open it up. On this business of, of individualism, back in the day of the Cultural Revolution, there was a two-line struggle between the capitalist road and the socialist road, and here was the question. Which is correct? Um... Public first, self second, or is it public first, self not at all? Now you know which one was the capitalist road and which one was the socialist road, right? Now I have thought about that a bit and come to the conclusion that they're both wrong. That it's self first for the public good, not self first full stop, right? So self first for the public good, that's what you'll learn when you get on an airplane and the stewardess says, or the flight attendant says, when the mask comes down, put it on your, uh, yourself first, right? Yeah. When I got trained in the fire service, it was when you roll up to a scene, your first obligation is to your own safety. Before you go rescue the person who's hanging out the third floor window saying, save me, save me, and you can see the flames behind her, take care of yourself first. Otherwise, you're on the ground, part of the problem. But if it's just me, myself, and I, you'd never volunteer for the fire service in the first damn place. Right? Why would you go out there and take that chance? Right? And so that question about individualism, there's nothing wrong with individualism, I don't think. But for what? Right? And that's that business about you've got to serve somebody in what we do, no matter what it is. All right, now, that's enough for, for us. Your turn. So people on the live stream can see. Start with you. Hey, can can I be heard? Okay, so well, let me just not be behind the pillar. Okay. It'll be easier. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, Martha. Um, sorry, not the not the only Martha in the room. Martha Livingston. Two things, Michael. First of all, what you just said is really Rabbi Hillel. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm for myself alone. What am I, if not now, when? 
So that's another way to say what you just said. But my main point, my main point is the issue that I had most trouble with in the book and that I had a little trouble with the way you presented it tonight. I, I was there back then and I remember exactly the moment when Reagan won the presidency and the police came out with a song and I said, wow, there's a band called the police. That would never have happened in the 60s or 70s and their song is called, I'll Be Watching You. Ooh, we're in a new zeitgeist, folks, aren't we? And you're right, it really felt like we lost. And, and all of that stuff you said is true, but framing it as, and we lost, really doesn't allow for all the hope that I think a lot of us have been feeling in the last period of time. There's a whole lot of unions. I don't have to tell you, you know better than I do. The a whole lot of union stuff going on, a whole lot of movement type of stuff going on. And I think it's really key at this point for people who understand stuff the way you do to talk to people who are confused about the basic bottom line question, who are our friends and who are our enemies? And that's where identity politics has really gotten in the way. And we really need to go back to that 2011 slogan, we are the 99%, because that unites all who can be united to defeat the bad guys. Okay, that's me. Okay, can people hear me? Good, okay. Th first of all, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you to all the panelists. Really very stimulating discussion. Um, I want to pick up on the idea of the American dream. Um, which, you know, of course we talk about all the time in the picket fence and the house and the two kids. And there are many American dreams. You know, my, pa my, my grandparents were immigrants. And they came, yes, for money. They had no money. They were peasants in Ukraine. So, you know, that's, that's what brought them here. There are people who came for, to be able to practice the religion that they believed in. There are people who, who, who have their own American dreams now and can't achieve them. Well, I knew E.L. Doctorow, and one of the things he said when he talked about justice, he said that if we really talk about justice, if in his, if a man has with a man or a woman has within them uh, that that desire to be a poet, that person should be able to be a poet. I mean, you know, that, that's, that should be part of the American dream, that you don't have to work those 80 hours a week trying to be one of that, you know, at 99, at that one percent out there. There are, there are many kinds of American dreams, and I think if we can somehow um, remind ourselves of that and remind others of that, that, may, that, that maybe that sh could be chipping away at this, at this production acquisition based dream. Thank you. Uh, hi, Michael. Uh, we, I was at Stony Brook when Michael was a professor, uh, very supportive of SDS, so we've known each other for a long time. Uh, my wife and I were watching a documentary recently, I think it's called Remote Access Medical. And it's about a yearly medical fair that they set up in a, in a southern uh, city. And uh, people line up from early in the morning in order to get free uh, diabetes testing, uh, free glasses, uh, free dental care. And the lines are huge. I mean, they just extend for like half a mile, right? And the vast majority of people coming for this free service are white. They are. And you know, in these southern states, they have refused, the politicians have refused to accept expanded Medicaid because they've racialized this program, even though the majority of beneficiaries are white or would be white if they, they had this. So it's a clear instance of how racism hurts, you know, white working class people. 
And there are people like Adolf Reed who have been writing about this, right? And I was just kind of wondering what the overlap is between what Reed is writing and what you're writing, and you know, what do you think his weaknesses are, or it's mainly strengths, you know? This is, we're doing an Alphonse and, Ruth, and, and Gaston routine up here. <clears throat> Any Alphonses over here? Oh, geez. So, okay. Uh, well, gee, there's, there's, it's, it's a very rich agenda of, of questions here. So thank you all again very much. It's so great to be here with all of you. It's just wonderful. Uh, um, to Martha Livingston, we did lose. Now, the book doesn't leave it at that. The book also talks about all of what's going on now and the insurgencies and all of that movement building. That's who this book is for. And in that sense, it's, uh, there's, I wouldn't say optimism. I'd say hope. You know, that keep hope alive stuff? There's a difference between hope and optimism. I'm not particularly optimistic, but I sure am hopeful. And uh, there's no other way to live, to, for me anyway. So I would say that um, it's important to realize and recognize that we are basically starting from scratch and what we're dealing with and who we're dealing with. Now, you know, the, the question that uh, Glenn raises is related to another thing that, that Martha put on, that, uh, you know, identity politics is getting in the way and, and we should understand that we're the 99%. And... I went down to um, Zuccotti Park and spoke there, and it's on some, I think it's on a YouTube page somewhere. And what I was trying to get there was, well, who is this 1%? And who is this 99%? If you just leave class as a question of income, you're missing the boat. Class is a question of power, and the income follows out of that power. And so I was encouraging the Occupy folk at Zuccotti Park to understand that when we talk about the 1%, we're not talking about income, which could be an anesthesiologist married to a, a, you know, a professor. That's not the enemy. That's not who we have to mobilize against. It's capital. And who are our friends? Who's this 99%? That's the working class. And too much of our lexicon in this country seems to think that the working class is, all that means is white. And black workers aren't workers, they're black. Women workers aren't workers, they're women. Uh-uh. Well, of course they're women, of course they're black, of course they're white. But the thing is that they're all workers. Now, the, if you ask about Adolf uh, Reed, you know, I think that we're sort of in the same kind of ballpark, but I think Adolf is a little less sympathetic to, to uh, uh, what you call it, uh, identity movements than I would be. Because, you know, if you look at what Ber the way Bernie ran his campaign, Bernie ran his campaign as the rising tide will lift all boats. That is not true. The rising tide will not lift black boats until you deal with racism as such, not as a worker issue, but as a black issue. And the same thing is true for uh, patriarchy and male chauvinism. So I think that, and th th that's the task, is how do you do them both together? And that's what I'm trying to get at the book, and I won't say anything more about it right now. <laughs> Go ahead. So on that, hell, can you hear me? This is kind of. Yeah, that's better. So I want to piggyback what he said about the identity. Again, just like a lot of folks, I did feel that way too about identity politics because through Bernie, it's actually how I got started in politics because I was in high school when he first ran. And, you know, I became a big fan. And through the all, from uh, all the universal programs that he was fighting for, healthcare, college, et cetera, um, and I was very critical of identity politics, like a lot of folks, with reason, because uh, as y'all know, you know, uh, centrists, they use that whole, okay, we'll get the first black this, first woman that, and 
they think that's enough. But obviously, there's so much more substance involved with getting people in power. Um, but I think I was uh, I was a little too unfair of, but we still. Because I understand the framing of we had to frame everything as a collective working class framework. But in that framework, like you said, you still had to squeeze in the layers involved in that group of people. You know, like a Muslim woman working at a store is going to go through even worse than a white man going working in the same store. They're both uh, exploited workers, of course, but it's not the same type of problems. It's. There's different ways you have to approach it. There's uh, different uh, 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 aspects involved. Um, and that kind of also comes into the whole American dream thing, right? When she talked about how everybody's American dreams are very different. That reminded me a lot of some of the fights going on in Long Island. How um, in certain areas, people want to develop you know, apartments and affordable housing. That's the argument they're making to go against that. They're like, our American dream was we lived in these beautiful suburbs where it was just me and my people and we didn't have to worry about these darker skinned people coming off the bus working over here. Like, no, like, I'd rather just have my my uh, my black parties and, and my 4th of Julys, you know? That is not what most of us here want, you know? So I feel like the term American dream is, is tossed around a lot and can be weaponized so much to get people to convince that we're going over, we're going towards the same goals but um so that's all I really want to say on that I don't have much I don't have much else to say really um yeah um this on okay kind of on that theme th there's something so important uh is sort of the intersection of uh race and and gender on 185 that I want to point out um Infant and maternal health in black families at the top of the income distribution is markedly worse than that of white families at the bottom of the income distribution. I, I know black women, uh, health, uh, health workers and professionals who are organizing around this, but to me it's, it's such an example of the salience of race that cannot be explained away by anything else. So important. Uh, where's that microphone? Right here. <laughs> One of us, anyway. Um, uh, everybody else stood up, so I suppose I should. Um, <laughs> speaking of uh, Zuccotti Park, you know, I found out I could go to sleep on a sheet of cardboard and a drizzle on top of concrete and go right to sleep. It was the getting up that was really, really a problem. And it's only gotten worse. So, um, uh, you know, Michael and I and some of the people who've spoken, who've spoken here, uh, and a lot of the people in the audience actually, or a good number of them, we were in the vanguard party of the American working class together in the 1970s. Yeah. And not only that, but the same vanguard party of the American working class out of 10 or 12 possible choices at the time. So that makes for a special bond and actually a continuity of issues and some of the stuff that we're talking about. Um, go to that. One of the things that that organization and that movement did not ha handle well was the question of culture. And, you know, it's been raised here. and. I don't think we can just say that, you know, there's all this culture and there's this. Look, culture in the United States now is a critical battlefield. It is. You got these, um, I'll try to keep my language clean here, but I'm not very good at it. Um, all these young men out there in the Midwest rolling coal, driving big trucks which have been specially adapted to pollute excessively just to make a statement. And it's not like, I mean, you know, maybe driving a big truck is fun, but driving a big truck that's poisoning the atmosphere is a cultural statement. It's a statement about who you are and who you want to be and how you want this society to be. And that's a statement we're at war with. Let's be clear on that. And 
we have actually, to, to go to the, uh, uh, some of the stuff that Martha said, which has to do with, um, uh, you know, we coming from the same tradition again, you know, we haven't just lost. I mean, we've made huge gains, okay? It wasn't necessarily battles that we understood or were in at the time, but to me, you know, at one and the same time that I am having a nightmare because of what happened to Roe v. Wade, because I came up when that, you know, I mean, me and my partner used to put up people before that decision and before states who rode on buses from the res in Minnesota to New York and looked for us with our little sign so we could put them up. And that was a hard time. And to see that, people trying to bring that back, is grueling. But that's part of the cultural war, too. Because the other side of it is, you know, all the stuff that people make light of, you know, gay marriage, you know, and so on and so forth. That's a huge win. That, you know, those of us who are of this age, when you were in high school, you know, whether or not you were gay, you were gay baited if you were in any wise different from the other people. And that has been turned around and that's irreversible. And now the, some of the gains of the women's movement, which includes, you know, the right to decide what to do with your own goddamn body. It turns out those may be not reversible, although they're trying that we seem to be winning. So, you know, we've won things that we didn't expect to win or that we wouldn't have, you know, if you were to ask me in, you know, 1978, well, you know, this revolution thing, will there be gay marriage? I mean, you know, who knows, you know? <laughs> What's going to happen, you know, 50 years from now when they try to take abortion rights away? Uh, all I'm saying is these are cultural war issues, and on a lot of those, we're winning. Um, thank you as well. Um, I'm Falake. Uh, thank you guys for coming too. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so I didn't get a, well, this is my first time here. Well, not at the People's Forum, but um, seeing your book. And um, I do want to, well, the only thing I could really analyze is the cover right now. Um, and by seeing it, I do see the Venn diagram of the intersectionalities of what is happening. And my question for you is, um, how did, was there a theory that you had in um, actually balancing the topics when bringing them up? Was there a top, well, was there a intersectionality that you wanted to um, bring forth more than um, another, or one that you felt like influenced one more than another in your book? Maybe one more, and then we'll wrap this up, and then we'll go to uh, have a good time and just hang out. <laughs> yeah, hi, I, I just wanted to pick up on that last uh, couple of points. Um, I'm afraid, Mike, your book is very weak on gender, um, and uh, you know, it's really noticeable that it's not really integrated into in, into the work that you're doing. And you, as an example, you mentioned um, the movement for women's equality. I'm sorry, there was a movement for women's liberation, and there is all the difference in the world between women's liberation and the liberation of, I would add, children and adults and men and so on and so forth. We're talking about liberation. We're not talking about equality. So I really think that you, you need to kind of recognize um, that that's a major component of the struggle, um, not just against capitalism, but for human development and for liberation. And that that is the essential counterpart to um, the, the, the exploitation and the poverty has to be faced, but at the same time, we're talking about building a movement in order to build a new society. And I think that the gender relations 
enters into that very much. The other thing that I think is being left out is the problem that capitalism is probably driving the entire human race to extinction. Um, and you know, that's, that's a kind of a problem. Um, <laughs> And, and young people in particular are more worried. I, you know, I, 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 I'm old enough that I'm probably not going to see the extinction happen. Um, but for young people, it's a very, very real issue. And that, that is, uh, has to be understood as the dynamic of capital. OK, I think we'll come back here. Daryl wanted to say some things, maybe you guys, and then I'll uh, finish it up. Sure. I do definitely want to double down and agree about the extinction part. I will say, um, you know, being an organizer at this point in time, that's been a huge obstacle for a lot of folks because they do feel that doomsday mentality of, well, we're just going to burn in 20, 30 years, so why even waste your energy fighting, you know? And there's a grain of truth to that, honestly, like, so it, it and it's something really difficult to tackle sometimes because, you know, we ought to try to the end, right? Like no matter what, but when it's something that is that so macro scale, like, because sometimes I would tell myself maybe I could just one day move away and leave the system, but an issue like that is inescapable. It doesn't matter where you live. If anything, if you live in the quieter parts of the world, they get hit the worst first. And we all know that through studies and evidence, you know? So I just want to just agree with you on that for sure. Like it's, it's something that um, does make it even more difficult to fight. Not saying that uh, we can't come around that or, or use that, that global issue to take that global energy and turn it into something more. Because like you said, that's an issue everybody can relate to. So hopefully we can use that relation at, to our favor. At least, like turn the problem into uh, something more, you know? So. Um, yeah, two, um, two quick thoughts. Just thinking about the climate crisis and the fear and the terror uh, and the sense of powerlessness. Um, so, you know, in terms of when, when we were mentioning the individual and the collective, um, one thing in this society is that in addition to doing a collective practice for justice, wherever you can make some kind of a difference acting with others, every individual needs this, this active struggle to, um, uh, to process and get rid of the toxins that capitalism puts into you. Um, the crazy ideas, the way it makes you hate yourself, the way it makes you even as a work working class person think you're a failure because you don't make more money and you don't have the fanciest clothes or the nicest car. I mean, it's it's a constant struggle at that level of, uh, of, the, of the personal to maintain sanity and this collective orientation for justice because it's so, so much trying to destroy you and trying to destroy your kids um, that I think all parents face, the propaganda that your kids get, and the way that um, social media, I think, is really undermining in this very scary way to me some of the fundamental sociality of human beings uh, and creating isolation and um, more difficulties in how communi we communicate with each other. Just, so that's the thing that, that you know, I think we think a lot as organizers, especially younger organizers. Um, final little thing, I, I know this is one kind of class difference in approaching um, women's liberation. Like my, from my mother, who never would have identified with women's liberation, but she agreed with women's rights. And she would say, um, she said, you know, uh, all this thing about women should be president, women should be head of the corporation, most women don't care about that. You know, what we care about is having health care and good schools for kids and that kind of stuff and um, that is a very sound you know class orientation there I think and I pass it to the rhetorician all oh, praises due to Allah thank you all so much for being here tonight I think we've modeled a great expression of the struggle being the school us just in this dialogue today uh, modeling that we don't have to agree but we can disagree without being disagreeable and I think great points were raised that we all can wrestle with and leave. Uh, a note I just took that um, I've been reading Du Bois so much recently. I, my wife knows I've been reading a lot of Du Bois and reading Black Instruction and the fusion efforts that took place in the 19th century. 
so much modeled what Barbara was doing in 2013 with the launch of the Moral Monday movement to now our Poor People's Campaign. So the, the, the torch is passed, the work is continuing, and just to be able to sit here with you, sir, and with Juliet and, and Darren Allen to bear witness to all these uh, who have assembled, I really think that uh, we're moving, as the campaign would say, forward together, not one step back. Thank you all so much. You know, Dennis said that uh, we didn't just lose, we, we won a lot, that's true. And uh, we won all that through intense struggle, and there's a whole discussion in here about politics and how to do politics between movement politics and electoral politics that I won't get into at this point. But I will just say that that victory also came with real defeats. and but real defeats within the victories, which make class more salient. So, you know, Bobby Kennedy said, we're gonna get to a black president within 40 years, and we did. But look what's going on in the black working class. That wasn't just a victory for black people, that was a victory for a certain section of black people who were absorbed into the ruling class and into the top echelons of American society. So you have to understand how that means that not only does uh, class uh, get divided by race, but race gets divided by class. And it's the same thing for women. There is, you know, who would have thought we would have had a woman uh, president or vice president or a serious woman as a presidential candidate? Who would have thought we'd have two or three women on the Supreme Court? Well, that's real gains for women. Every little girl can look and see that there are three women on the Supreme Court, and that means women belong there. That's true. Is it only two? Four. All right, four women on the Supreme Court. I think that that, I think that, that is so much of a victory. But look what's going on with women in the working class in this country. What that means is that the victories of the women's movement, the women's liberation movement, or however you want to call it, is totally inflected by class. And we need to understand as we address class questions how gender issues fit into that. But as we address gender issues, we have to understand that it's just not enough to say, oh, there should be women's liberation because some women will be drawn into the corporate elite and most women are gonna continue to be oppressed. And that means that we have to sort of walk on two legs or three legs or however many multi, you know, be multipedes and walk on all these legs to deal with all of these different, uh, with all these different things. Um, so I'll just, uh, I, I don't know, there's just such a rich agenda of, of, of work and, and, and thinking that we've all brought into this discussion and so much more that we could bring in and should bring in. And that's really what this book is about. This book is trying to bring out that conversation. And that's why when I'm going around with these book tour, I'm not going just to talk on my own. I want to have this conversation with people in every city where I go. And it's organized that way so that we can continue that conversation among us and with our friends and colleagues and enemies. You know, Martha likes me to say, if you're not doing politics with people you can't stand, you're not doing politics. So, you know, we got to really, you know, have friends, but really work uh, in a very, very broad net. So please uh, take a look at this book, pass it on to people, give it to kids for Christmas. Or, <laughs> you know, you're looking for a present, here it is. Uh, buy multiple copies. Uh, okay, folks, thanks uh, very much again to the People's Forum and to all of you. Yes, thank you so much. Give it up to our panelists. And again, I mean, it seems like a lot of you already have your books and have gotten your autographs. But if you haven't, we have books at the front um, and Michael will be around for a bit as well to sign. Thank you all. Have a good night.